Thank you, folks. When I was 16 years old, 9-11 happened. I remember the violence that was inflicted on us on 9-11 and the violence which continues to infect us to this very day. Whether it was the wars in Afghanistan or Iraq or the several countries we've drone bombed or sent troops into or supplied arms to since, or the raids and deportations of 13,000 people through the Muslim registry, or the violent acts on Muslims or people thought to be Muslims. We've been at a fever point for years with this infection. The fear, uncertainty, and isolation that I felt in those days are things that are still part of me to this very day and of the community that I'm so privileged to organize. When those two planes struck the Twin Towers and the World Trade Center came crashing down, so did any illusion of safety and belonging to this country for the 16-year-old Bangladeshi Muslim girl that was me. And these memories that I'm sharing with you are memories that were transformative moments that have changed the makeup of who I am, where coming out of them, I was not the same person going in. One of these memories was two months after 9-11 when my guidance counselor came into my English class because my English teacher was upset that most people in our class were not standing up to say the Pledge of Allegiance. So my guidance counselor stood in front of a class of 25 black and brown students right from before the Pledge of Allegiance was about to start and she told us the following. I don't understand why all of you do not show the respect our country deserves. Everyone here should be putting their hands on their hearts and saying the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the country that feeds you, clothes you, shelters you, and protects you. And within minutes, the call for the Pledge of Allegiance came on and every single student stood up faced the flag, and said the Pledge of Allegiance. Everyone except me. That moment was not only incredibly infuriating for me to have to hear these words from my guidance counselor, that words that were so sharply different from the reality that I and my peers were living, it was also incredibly awkward because my seat in that classroom was at the back of the class, directly underneath where the flag was hanging. So I stayed seated and was stared down by that room of students and my angry white guidance counselor and teacher. Stand by the patriotism, stand for the flag. What they were really saying was, be grateful for your seat at the table, even when you're also on the menu. And in those dark days during high school, a book landed in my hands from my AP US history teacher, Mr. Salik. The book was A People's History of the United States by Howard Zinn who, by the way, is still the only white man I've ever cried over when he died in 2010. Despite the horrors it describes within its pages, like genocide of indigenous populations, the enslavement of black people, Japanese internment camps, Jim Crow laws, lynchings, this book was oddly calming for me, and it changed my life. For the first time, I understood that what was happening to me, my community, and all other oppressed communities was not happening for the first time at all. This book gave me the clarity I was looking for, that the racism carried out through mass deportations, detentions, imprisonment, surveillance, wars, were very American patriotism and white nationalist-driven traditions. But it wasn't enough for me to know this. It wasn't enough that I knew what the problems were and why they were wrong, because I wanted to do something to replace my moments of fear and isolation with infinite moments of courage and community. And even when I knew what I wanted, I didn't know what it would look like and I didn't know where to look. That is until I came to Trump, Daisy's Rising Up and Moving, when I was 17 years old and joined as a youth member. Fun fact, Drum was named after the original drum here in Detroit, the Dodge Revolutionary Union Movement that organized black auto workers and did wildcat strikes. So I'm incredibly honored to be part of that history and lineage. And by the way, the term Desi also means people of the South Asian diaspora. And DRUM as an organization in New York City or of like 4,000 members, we organize working class South Asian and Indo-Caribbean workers, youth and adults to fight for justice and build our power. And I came in through their summer youth program and ironically, the flyer for the DRUM internship was actually in my guidance counselor's office. Uh, because buried treasures are always found in the most unlikely places. And at Trump, it was the first time that I was in a place 
with other young working class brown women like me. Their parents, just like my parents, were taxi drivers, domestic workers, restaurant workers, street vendors, construction workers. And we were the ones to decide that we didn't need middle and upper class desi men or lawyers or business owners or any self-appointed leader to come defend us or speak for us. And that we were enough and capable of getting our loved ones from detention, capable of speaking for ourselves, capable of learning to punch above our weight, and that no table was worth sitting at if the items on the menu were our own people. That summer, after I joined DRUM's youth program, I had to leave for Dickinson College to a small rural town in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. And it was a kind of school where there were students who were coming from families who could afford to pay $50,000 a year in tuition, owned homes, several cars, lived in places where their average public school was the equivalent of the best public schools in New York City. So they were confused when I talked about the metal detectors, scanners, and security guards that I had to go through every day at my high school before I could start my morning class, or how I could have been raised on food stamps if I had two full-time working parents providing for us. They lived lives that were just night and day from my own and the people I grew up with. These class differences made it hard for me to relate to other South Asian students who were born here or were raised in America like myself. I was having this conversation with another Desi student and we were talking about her families. She was a daughter of a doctor. And when she learned that my mom is a domestic worker and my dad is a taxi driver, she said, but you seem like you're just as smart as everyone else here. Are you sure you're not middle class? Yeah, girl, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, for me, it wasn't that I just had to fight racism, but also classism for my own people. Race and class were inseparable for me, my family, the people I grew up with, and the community I organized, which is why I came back to organize with DRUM. And it's been 15 years to, since I've stepped into DRUM, and it continues to be quite a journey. This journey has included many people who have not only shared this journey with me, but have paved the road that I'm walking on. And it's a road that I know many of you here do walk on, and I hope many more will join us in this journey into organizing. And some of the folks that stick out in this journey is drum leader Shahina, who joined because NYPD paid $100,000 to an informer to entrap her 19-year-old son into a fake terrorism case and sent him to prison for 34 years. She became the pioneer in building out a racial justice movement that exposed the way law enforcement preyed on vulnerable people in our communities. Another is Nadira, the fierce mother of two children whose husband was taken away by the NYPD and handed over to immigration, and he was riding away in detention center for 18 months. That is until she decided to stop listening to the men in her family and joined organizing to pass a bill in city council to prevent undocumented people without criminal charges from being handed over to ICE by the police and later freed her husband. And nothing says fuck the patriarchy quite like that. <laughs> and Ghazi, the undocumented worker whose employer forced her to cross the street and she was run over by a cab. Despite having all the bones in her right arm crushed and then later fired by the same employer, she came back with the fury and vengeance to fight for full back pay for the time she worked and was being paid $4 an hour for 14 hour work days. Causing a chain effect in several South Asian stores and restaurants throughout the city for Desi workers to start demanding minimum wage, filing back wage claims, and led to the first South Asian worker center. And none of these incredible accomplishments of these warriors were easy. In fact, the biggest barriers they and the organization faced in our work wasn't just institutional racism, it was also classism. And the people who benefit from working class people's labor and pain. And this includes other people of color. The first face we always encountered doubting how winnable or how practical and how much we could win over that soft center marshmallow we were being, blocking us from accessing spaces of power and resources were other middle class and upper class Desis. Because not all our skin folk are kin folk. And while that's not just something about our community, that's true across all communities of color, right now there is something very particularly different. What's different about now? It isn't just that white nationalism is on the rise, What's different now is how people on our side are willing to push harder against racism and misogyny. Racism and sexism are being taken seriously in a way in organizing, but there's 
a gap, and it's class. As an organizer in a working class organization, the urgency to fight classism both within our communities of color and outside of our communities cannot be underestimated in these times. In these times of when an angry white working class continues to gravitate towards right wing white nationalist movements and working class communities of color are actually bearing the consequences of this. And class continues to be amongst the least acknowledged system within our racial justice movement in the US. So we think it's amazing when people of color, women, LGBTQ folks who look like us take offices or run multi-billion dollar companies, become celebrities, become activists, become artists. And it is incredible as we continue to fight against white nationalism and supremacy. But we never look to add class background as a factor to be wowed by. And we often don't hold most of these people accountable if and when they do things that harm working class and poor communities of color. And people right now, while are being encouraged and guided to be courageous about the impact of racism on them, both personally and systemically, both as oppressed by it and are having the privilege to benefit from racism. And yet, that is not how class is viewed or how we're expected to acknowledge it and learn from it. How many of you ask yourself or other people, how has class shaped my experience in life? How have I or my community been hurt or have benefited from classism? Do I look at an issue like the migrant and refugee caravan with an understanding from the perspective of class and how classism through various US economic and political policies have forced these poor people from their homelands? Do we look at mass incarceration, immigration, reproductive justice, climate change through how classism determines the course of the lives of people impacted by them? Let me ask some of you guys some questions in this audience. Did you have the means to pay for your own flight, hotel, and conference fees? Or did someone else or an organization cover you? Or even if you were covered by your organization, could you have afforded it anyway? These questions matter because their answers reflect who often gets to come to spaces to strategize and build the future of our movements, and what and who gets prioritized. And classism is one of the many fault lines that we need to pay attention to in our collective spaces like the one we're in today. Because which class attends, which class gets to voice their experience, which class gets to determine the metrics of what is considered winnable, practical, worth fighting for, and who our movements at the end of the day is accountable to. So what is the answer to how we deal with these questions I've asked? And the answer is intersectionality. It's a popular term that's been thrown around. And to clarify, there is a difference between identity politics and intersectionality. Identity politics is the salami slicing of identities and pitting of oppressed communities against each other. Intersectionality is the practice and perfection of solidarity between oppressed communities. And it's this practice of solidarity that allowed for room for leaders, like drum leaders of the stories that I shared with you today. And a key part of that practice of intersectionality for us was centering class along with race and gender. Not behind it, not hidden away, but along with it. And I sincerely hope that we're willing to face race and battle racism just as uh, strongly as we are doing that in all of its minute and gigantic forms. I hope we will be just as relentless and honest in our willingness to face class and end classism in its many-headed forms, both in each of us and in our movements. Because that is our best fighting chance to turn over tables and burn those menus. Thank you.